Mr. Chairman, dear colleague, Mrs. Atilgan, Excellencies, dear colleagues from the Georgian Parliament, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. First of all, I thank you, Mr. Chairman, for your very kind uh, remarks, and uh, you, Mr. Mrs. Atelgan, for your invitation, and I thank uh, you all for your interest in this uh, conversation or talk or whatever it might uh, become. Um, I guess I have to explain the extraordinary um, <coughs> A program of my first visit uh, to your country, and um, it, it, it was correctly being uh, uh, explained that I came to Tbilisi, uh, left the city after less than 24 hours, I don't know exactly. Um, the reason was not um, because I was uh, homesick or I was interested in making sure that uh, I was still in the same uh, position in Germany, although I had left uh, the country. The reason simply was that we had a rather serious negotiation in our constitutional court dealing with a particular subject of the parliament. And I thought it was a necessary demonstration of respect to our constitutional court and a demonstration of respect to the country that I had to interrupt the visit, but that I completed the visit as I had promised. This is my understanding of how we should behave and how we should deal with each other, particularly in Europe. Well, ladies and gentlemen, on Europe, nearly everything has already been said. History and culture, orientations, principles, values, errors, achievements, wars and peace, conflicts and cooperation. So you hopefully don't expect me to tell you anything completely new about Europe. I will rather try to put the actual challenges of Europe, which obviously exist, in the framework of historical experiences. Because I'm completely convinced that there are some old lessons which should be retaught and some new experience which we should soberly analyze. And um, Mrs. Altigan has already referred to two historical data. In my understanding, there are at least three major landmarks of the younger history of uh, European history which we should commemorate this year, 2015. The first is, of course, the 17th anniversary of the end of the Second World War. The second is the, fifth, the 40th anniversary of the Helsinki Conference, which had a prominent role in the time of the so-called Cold War, and the third is, of course, the 25th anniversary of the reunification for, uh, of Germany, which I personally prefer to refer to as the process of political transformation in Germany, during which Germany could be reunified. But without this process, the reunification of Germany would never have happened. So you cannot separate one from the other. And my understanding of the present situation in Europe has a lot to do with those changes which have taken place about 25 years ago, as well in favorable 
and to some extent unfavorable <coughs> terms. The separation of Germany, and to be precise, the separation of Europe The obvious immediate result of the Second World War, which was caused by Germany, and the ambition of dominating Europe. I won't deliver a historical lesson but I should at least make the remark that the Second World War was the Second World War in the same century, following a first one, which also took place in Europe, and without which the second probably wouldn't have taken place. And it does make sense, not only in historical terms, but in political terms, to remind the main reason why the first world war in Europe occurred. It was the consequence of the ambition of nation states in Europe, not only to confirm zones of influence, but to expand panned the respective zones of influence with a mutual interest of dominating each other. And we had this particular situation at the edge of the centuries from the 19th to the 20th uh, century where countries like Germany, Austria, France, Great Britain, Russia, were competing against each other in this intention and ambition not only to stabilize the respective zones of influence, but if possible, to dominate Europe. The First World War was the consequence of this common error throughout Europe. And we should perhaps remind ourselves that the unwanted, unforeseeable result of this First World War in Europe was the elimination of the European domination of history. If at all, it is precisely that period in which the European dominated history of mankind came to an end. From this point onwards, we had a new structure on this globe. And Europe has never ever got the same position as it had before. After the Second World War, we had, in addition to the consequences of the First World War, the separation of Europe in two halves, one belonging to the so-called Western democracy, the other being ruled by authoritarian regimes being dominated by the Soviet Union. The border across Europe went throughout Germany. In historical terms, we are not so far away from that period of the, his of the European history as we sometimes tend to assume 
And um, in so far, it does make sense to refer to the Helsinki conference, which I quoted for this reason, as one of the other important landmarks of the European uh, history, which took place 40 years ago in Helsinki. And we should remember ourselves, and if necessary, some partners of that approach, that this conference took place under the condition of a separated Europe, under the condition of two competing political blocs, with the common interest of at least limiting the risks of the given situation and as far as possible defining common rules for dealing with each other. This conference in Helsinki resulted in a document being signed not only by the European states, but also by the Soviet Union, by the United States and Canada. And the organization being the result of this conference, the organization for security and cooperation in Europe, is still the only format we have in which the European countries, Russia and America, has a common ground for dealing with each other. Under given principles, being negotiated and signed by all the participating states, including Russia, including the United States. By the way, it does make sense to remind us that on this conference two German states participated, which was not a self-explaining experience at that time, to be honest. It was a major controversial issue in the domestic policy of the Federal Republic of Germany, whether we should deal with another German government, which in our understanding neither had democratic legitimation nor an acceptance by its population, whether we should deal with such a second German government under the same framework conditions. We did. Fortunately, we did. Because there is no serious doubt under historians that without the principles which have been negotiated and accepted by all member states at this conference, the further development in Europe would hardly have taken place the way in which it took place. The principles of that conference, national self-determination, non-interference in the domestic affairs of any existing state or country, territorial integrity, became points of reference for everybody being interested in a development in Europe as a whole and in respective countries and state throughout Europe. And it was this framework which at the end made the transformation process possible which took place in the Middle Eastern states of Europe, including the GDR, with a prominent 
event of the Berlin Wall falling in November 1989. This spectacular event was neither predictable nor unavoidable. But from the present perspective, it seems nearly a logic part in a continued process. And it was precisely this context in which the German unification could take place. We have, of course, celebrated this extraordinary event of our German history last autumn with a lot of foreign guests and we had the pleasure that also Mr. Gorbachev participated in the ceremonies in Berlin at the time. Michael Gorbachev used his appearance in Berlin for several interviews from which I would like to quote two remarks which I think have some significance regarding the actual challenges of Europe at the moment. He has been asked whether it is true that during the time where the negotiations took place under which the German unification could become possible, there was a promise or even a guarantee or even an agreement or even a treaty that the European Union or NATO would never expand over the former borders of the separated Europe. Which part of this question would explain the irritations of a present Russian government as far as the developments in the meantime are concerned. The answer of Mr. Gorbachev was, that is a myth. This question didn't even take place in all the negotiations we had at that time. And there is no saying of having any kind of agreements in so far by the way, this was a period in which the Warsaw Pact still existed. And if at all, only a few people could assume that he would no longer exist for the foreseeable future. The second interesting remark which he made was his how should I name it, advertising for the Russian policy in this period. I have, of course, a problem that my decision to speak in English hopefully makes it easier for you to understand what I mean, but much more difficult for me to express what I think. <laughs> And he told the interviewer that he, Mikhail Gorbachev, understands quite well the position and the policy of Vladimir Putin. And I used the opportunity of meeting him, Gorbachev, 
the following day to address his personal contribution of the peaceful change which took place not only in Germany, also in Poland, in Hungary, in other respective East, Middle East, German, East uh, European uh, country, and the high risk which he run with his personal engagement, without which Germany hardly would have got the opportunity to implement the principles of the Helsinki Pact, national self-determination, territorial integrity, etc. And I've added that he certainly would understand that given this particular experience and representing a country which has profited from this mood, this joint conviction of how Europe should function, under which principles, Germany would ever feel committed to support any country in the world in order to get national self-determination, territorial integrity, the right of non-interference in its own domestic affairs. It's obvious that we are talking on actual challenges and historical experiences at the same time. And my strong recommendation, as far as I have to make recommendations as all, is that we shouldn't give up this connection between historical experiences and actual challenges. I probably don't have to explain that and why Germany in the new Europe we are going to build jointly plays a rather prominent role. I should perhaps add that responsible German politicians feel more and more in a very, very complicated situation because for understandable reasons, Germany has got more and more a position in Europe in which the rest of Europe, Germany never would have seen at all after the historical experiences of the first half of the 20th century. And at the same time, we feel to be in a position being confronted with expectations of our neighbors, which the majority of our own population doesn't like at all. They don't expect us to play a particular role. They rather expect, uh, expect us to play an invisible role, a non-prominent role within Europe and above the European borders, which for obvious reasons, it is not, it's not a realistic um, uh, approach. Well, When we jointly, Mrs. Attilgan and I, quoted this year being a year of commemoration of uh, historical landmarks, I feel obliged to add that a well-known German historian, Heinrich August Winkler, explained at the end of last year that in his perception, historians probably 
would refer to the year 2014 as the next landmark in the younger European history. And the reason he referred to was this year, 2014, is probably the end of the next period of the European history. At least in terms of ending illusions, which have been part of the process of the last years, and particularly the illusion that once and forever, Europe would have agreed on principles, on values, on rules, which everybody and any single country would feel committed to. And this is indeed the major challenge which we are all confronted with, not only since the last year, but certainly last year made it obvious for nearly everybody that we are in such a new situation which we have to deal with. As it is impossible anyway to address all the single aspects of the different developments in Europe, in Ukraine, in your country, in other parts of uh, Europe, I would like to conclude with three more or less general uh, remarks which might help to find an orientation in the forthcoming weeks and months for what I hope will become a joint approach of the European countries to what I think is a joint challenge. My first remark deals with time. We have all agreed that for the future of Europe, under the traumatic experiences of two world wars which took place in Europe, we would only accept peaceful changes in Europe. We would never ever accept violent means, military means, in order to change borders or influence zones or whatever you might quote. Peaceful developments take time and need time. Unfortunately, much more, than, much more time than wars, which seldom reach the wanted results. And this is one of the major and hopefully unforgotten lessons of the last century. The both disastrous wars in Europe reached none of the aims which have been in mind by any of the respective partners and countries in the given circumstances. And on the other hand, to overcome the separation of Europe, including the separation of Germany, needed decades. It was not a matter of some weeks or several weekends. And unfortunately, it took more time than people have because they only have their lives and not an unlimited period for historical developments. But nevertheless, everybody might ask himself and answer himself the question, what probably would have been the results 
if after the establishment of the Berlin Wall, West Germany or the Allied forces being responsible for West Berlin or NATO would have react militarily. Does anybody seriously believe we would have got immediately the unification of Germany and the unification of Europe? So this is an unfavorable, unconvenient at least lesson, but it is a lesson. Peaceful developments need time, sometimes much more time than we like to accept. Second remark refers to realities. Again, to some extent, I'm referring a German experience. If you want to change realities, you have to identify them. And you have to come to terms with the realities as they are, even if you don't like them. You have to find a way to deal with the realities as they are. And you cannot compensate this necessity by wishful thinking what a better reality would be, as long as it doesn't exist. And there is a third and last remark. which deals with the world of the 21st century, which we have named being the time of globalization. My understanding of globalization is that national state sovereignty no longer exists. What has been a major feature of the self-understanding of any state being sovereign, being not only responsible for its own affairs, but being able to define its own affairs, precisely this option has gone. In times of globalization, there is no longer a realistic perspective for state sovereignty in terms of nation states. And the perhaps only intelligent, certainly by far most intelligent, most ambitious, and unfortunately most complicated answer to this challenge is Europe. Being understood as a process of nation states deciding to transfer sovereign rights they have, theoretically, to a community which is not a state, but has to behave as if it were a state in order to implement the activities which the nation states have transferred to this union in order to keep a rest of sovereignty in times of globalization. The temptation to overcome this perception that there is no chance of staying independent, of playing a substantial, significant role, being a soloist, is obvious, particularly outside the present member states of the European Union. But we should keep this historical perception that we have a chance if we meet and overcome this challenge jointly. 
not with different approaches of different countries, but with a joint approach for a joint challenge. Perhaps the shortest version of this perception is already 60 years old. It has been made by Konrad Adenauer, one of the founding fathers of Germany after the Second World War. And he, in the early 50s, in the very beginning of the process of politically and economically integrating Europe, said European unity was a dream of a few people. It became a hope for many. Today, it is a necessity for us all. This is certainly true. And this could be and should be a program. I don't have to explain all my Georgian friends that in the two approaches of Georgia in the last century to become an independent state, Germany played a prominent role. So we not only share the two first letters of our country name, we even share historical moments in our respective history. And the independence of Georgia is part of the same historical change of Europe at the end of the 80s and the first years of the 90s of last century in which the unification of Germany took place. This again does not mean that Germany and Georgia jointly can solve all the problems which already exist or still exist in Europe, but it could and should mean that we have a common interest and hopefully a common commitment. At least this is my understanding and fortunately the understanding of the political class in Germany with huge majorities in our parliament and therefore I'm rather confident as far as our ability is concerned to meet the challenges which we face at the moment. Thank you for your attention. Thank you.